my father kissing me, hugging me, or telling me he loved me. And the uncle who raised me, who I lived under his roof, you know, was a functional alcoholic who probably said 10 words to me in his entire life. You know I love you being one of them. So when he raped me, I thought that was a demonstration of his love. So I was on the other end of being promiscuous, A, wanting to feel loved, and number two, um, because I was shuttled around to so many, my job was to make people happy, to please people. Mm -hmm. And as a young, vulnerable, black, red, brown girl with absolutely no woman demonstrating to me who I was and how I was supposed to be, I gave myself away. Then so by the time I'm 21 and understanding this, I'm totally unworthy. You know, somehow I ended up in front of a black woman, um, you know, uh, just very, you know, I said, oh, wow, this is, this is, this is it. And, you know, I'm, and I sat there and, and Dr. Raman, it was, she just looked at me like I was crazy. I didn't know what to do. I don't know. How do you do it? How do you, how, how, how do you, how do you, I don't know. She just sat there looking at me. I'm looking at her for an hour, 45 minutes. And finally I had my head in my hands and she said, do you have a headache? I said, no, I have a headache.
of my father kissing me, hugging me, or telling me he loved me. And the uncle who raised me, who I lived under his roof, you know, was a functional alcoholic who probably said 10 words to me in his entire life. You know I love you being one of them. So when he raped me, I thought that was a demonstration of his love. So I was on the other end of being promiscuous, A, wanting to feel loved, and number two, um, because I was shuttled around to so many, my job was to make people happy, to please people. Mm -hmm. And as a young, vulnerable, black, red, brown girl with absolutely no woman demonstrating to me who I was and how I was supposed to be, I gave myself away. Then so by the time I'm 21 and understanding this, I'm totally unworthy. You know, somehow I ended up in front of a black woman, um, you know, uh, just very, you know, I've said, oh, wow, this is, this is, this is it. And, you know, I'm, and I sat there and, and Dr. Raman, it was, she just looked at me like I was crazy. I didn't know what to do. I don't know. How do you do it? How do you, how, how, how do you, how do you, I don't know. She just sat there looking at me. I'm looking at her for an hour, 45 minutes. And finally I had my head in my hands and she said, do you have a headache? I said, no, I have a headache. The Invisible Ache, Black men identifying their pain and reclaiming their power. An invitation. COVID-19 shut the world down, but there is another pandemic that merits urgent attention. The mental health crisis leading to rising rates of depression and anxiety among Black boys and men. It's hard because Black men are consumed by a definition of themselves imposed by others. As Isabel Wilkerson noted in her seminal book, Case, they are constrained by an American racial hierarchy that has become the literal tomb, etching them into a stereotype and denying them their full humanity. The idea that black men are violent and unworthy is cruel and untrue, yet, it has the power to swallow a man whole, becoming the operating system for how the world treats him and sometimes, tragically, dictating how he sees and treats himself. Deep bow, deep bow and welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us this evening for this incredible community conversation. This is a community conversation about the invisible ache. Black men identifying their pain and reclaiming their power. And I am so honored and humbled to be able to facilitate this conversation this evening to begin taking us in this community and the men in our community and the women in a new direction with a new level of consciousness about who our men are, who our sons are, our fathers, who our brothers are, who our husbands are, and how we can support them and how we can stand with them as they move through their healing. This incredible book, The Invisible Ache, authored by the esteemed actor, Courtney B. Vance, and the renowned clinical psychologist, Dr. Dr. Robin L. Smith really pulls the curtain back and opens a door and an opportunity, a possibility for us to see Black men differently and to understand the challenges, the struggles, and the potential of their mental health. So I am really honored to be here. I have a request. I have a request. And I hope you know I love you. I love you. I, I can't say that enough to enough people. I'm gonna ask the women to be still, be still. That means no chatting, no asking questions. We are so glad you are here, but as women, 
tonight, let us hold space. We don't always have to have something to say. I really want the brothers to feel comfortable, to feel safe, and for us to leave space for them. So very often as women, we take up all the space in the room. <laughs> and so we don't want to do that tonight. This is a time and a space in this conversation for men. So ladies, join me. As the facilitator, I have to uh, be present, but I'm going to ask us, be still. Hold your voice. Be here in your heart and let the brothers have the floor. Our first guest tonight, I tell you, it's, it's funny when you're Jan Van Zandt and you meet somebody, you don't like want to fan out. <laughs> but how is I? <laughs> I'm in the room with my son, my friend. I've watched him literally grow up in front of my eyes. And to really be present with him, physically present with him. I've been present with him spiritually for a long, long time but to be physically present with him and to feel his energy and to share spirit and time and space with him was an incredible experience. And I'm so grateful to know that he is who he is. We know him as Nick Cannon. We've seen him everywhere. I mean, this guy is like, the, he's like a creative, energetic, energizer bunny. He's everywhere doing everything. But what he's doing right now caught my attention caught my awareness, and I'm so glad and honored that he could be here with us tonight. Nick has begun or is engaging in a process called council culture, not cancel, but council culture, where he's bringing to the forefront issues and resources for men, Black men, but for all men, dealing with the mental health issues, dealing with the challenges they face, because so many men and many of his friends, we had that conversation, have been canceled for a misstep, a mistake, bad behavior. And we live in a law and order society where there's very little space or time for redemption. And so when a black man falls, he's down for the count unless he claws his way back up and is deemed acceptable, acceptable by those uh, in the power in the know. So Nick has started an incredible movement called Council Culture. You can see it, I believe, on YouTube, but he's taking time to be with us tonight. There he is. Hello, my beloved. The queen, it is an honor and privilege to be in your presence once again. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much for, I, I know you got a heart out. So I, I want to talk to you because I think people need to understand uh, and appreciate all that uh, you're doing and, and the benefit it is to them. So tell us about council culture. Why did you think it was important to promote a council culture right now? Uh, so many reasons. One, because I need it. I mean, <laughs> I, from a space, and you know, even within our, our conversation, it's like as someone who has been operating in this world of therapy for for quite some time now, um, I I feel like I needed to create a, a safe space and a brave place for my brothers to be able to experience this this weight being lifted, uh, this this light, this uh, this wealth of of wisdom that comes from within, really, of when you are allowed to share, when you're allowed to feel feel seen, when you're allowed to feel heard, and and you can ask any question, you can you can talk about you know, the, the trauma, you can talk about the ways that you were raised, you can talk about the missteps and the things that have happened. And, um, and, and you know, I, I think what you and I discuss is like healing in the public eye, uh, having that opportunity to say, I need help, I need growth, um, I'm, I'm seeking counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, because I, 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 I feel like I'm, I've been canceled many times. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> different communities are different just because you know uh i i am outspoken i i i i am you know sometimes overzealous with with my my passion so i know sometimes and i'm learning you know as we it's it's better to listen it's better to take in and, and it's it's always there's, there's nothing wrong with saying um i stand corrected i or i 
I'm learning. I'm, I'm going through this process. And so with council culture, I'm bringing so many different conversations, so much dialogue from uh, people like yourself who have such a wealth of, of knowledge and, and information and wisdom in the space uh, of healing. And uh, but then at the same time, for many in our community who need that counsel and just to know that it, oh, it's it's OK to say I messed up. It's OK to say I don't know. It's OK to say um, I, I need help. And hopefully this platform, uh, like you said, it's, it's, we're starting in these type of conversations and dialogue, and, you know, taking the Internet by storm. But it's growing from we're doing you know public speaking. We're doing books. We're doing, you know, television shows that, you know, the council culture television show will actually be um, able to be viewed in, in June on, uh, you know, our Amazon platform. So I'm just excited that, you know, all that God has given me and allow me to share. So it's, uh, you know, turning my pain into purpose more than anything. Nick, did you have an invisible ache? I mean, you've been really transparent about going to therapy and the benefit of it. Before that, did you have an invisible ache? Yeah, I mean, I definitely did. I mean, uh, uh, the, the book puts it so profoundly, and that's why I even had the opportunity to 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 share my my love uh, with Courtney B. Vance uh, in just a random passing. Uh, I actually ran into him coming out of my therapist's office one Friday <laughs> morning, and uh, the way they that they talk about the invisible it mainly is just that there's been so many times, and, and, and he puts it so eloquently in the book that no matter what where you are in life, success, the peaks, the highs, you could be a doctor, you can be an actor, you can be an athlete, uh, even, but when you receive all of the accolades, all of the praise, you can still feel invisible, you know, and you can still feel just based off of, wow, people only see me when I'm giving them what they need from me or what they desire from me. So I would say I've constantly felt that way to one who has to always be on and always say the correct things and always uh, be a, a patriarch in certain spaces. Uh, that comes with not being seen when you are vulnerable. That comes with not being seen when you're uncertain. That makes you want to cower. That makes you uh, at times really not be sure of yourself and therefore feel small in certain spaces. Uh, so I, I would say, you know, throughout my career, throughout my life, being, you know, as a father, there's many times where uh, I feel like, you know, my representative may have been seen, but the true me in my heart has, has been unseen. That's how I felt when I, I walked into your studio. You know, I, like I said, I've been watching you forever, like the rest of us. But to to see you, to see your space, to feel you, uh, it, it was a very powerful experience that made me reflect on some of the ways you have been canceled and attacked. And, and in thinking about that, I, I wanted to ask you, is that why so many men are what I call allergic to asking for help? <laughs> I say they're allergic, you know, yeah. because they avoid it, they resist it, they avoid, resist asking for, for help and sometimes receiving help. Is that because of the way you have been invisible? I think because we're all, we, you know, we've been programmed for so long to, to you know, even when we're driving, we don't need direction. We got this. <laughs> <laughs> Just sit back and ride. I'm, I'm in the driver's seat. But um, when you remove that, I do, I do honestly feel that it's that inner child, that, that little boy that is seeking direction. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you definitely have to find a balance because I am a true believer in standing in your strength, um, even in its hardest times. You know, as we always know, you never know how strong you are until being strong is your only option. And that's, that's the autobiography of every black man. Um, but there's nothing wrong with just throwing your hands up, and, you know, giving it to God, saying, I don't know. Uh, and allowing the universe to to control where that direction takes you. So I I you know to to answer your question, I I felt like I feel like this daily, you know. Um, even when I am certain of something, you know, we even as a leader, as as someone who's looking to 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 help and guide others, there's this constant 
uncertainty uh, that, you know, and again, that's, I believe that's why I even created council cultures because I'm, I'm still seeking counsel. I'm still, I don't, I, I know I don't have any of the answers, but I got all the questions. <laughs> Let me ask you, Nick, uh, because you're you're a little younger than me, not much, just a little bit. <laughs> How do women need to be? You know, one of the things when we came on, I asked the sister women to be still, mm. be still and invite the men to come forward, because I think we live in a society where many of us women function as men in skirts, mm. you know. We are the aggressors. We are the ones out there. We have the voice. We have all of that going on. Uh, and we don't, we think that, or we've been programmed. I mean, you know, we got our own stuff. I've been working on that for 40 years. So, <laughs> but we ain't talking about us today. How do women need to be with a man or how should we be? Can we be in order to be supportive when he's in his vulnerable moment, whatever that moment is. Because I think sometimes we try to talk you all out of it. Uh, if you could share that, I think that would be really helpful. That's such a beautiful question and, and, and so relevant to you know us being here today because I believe, and I think I even said this to you when we were sitting down, I, the world's been waiting for you and I to get together. <laughs> And they 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 wanted you to fix my life. <laughs> yeah. Baby falls in my arm. <laughs> and uh, you 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 led me with such compassion. Um told me not to be so hard on myself. Mm-hmm. And I almost before we sat down, I sat down and I was like, I'm prepared. I know she she gonna beat me up. <laughs> and I I deserve it. Everything that she say to me, I'm gonna just take it in and I'm gonna listen. Um, but you did almost the exact opposite. You you listened to me and you you just showered me with love and compassion. And, and I, I use that as an example because it's funny, I even saw in the comments they're like, oh, she didn't hit him hard enough. Or, oh, she didn't say she and I'm like, I I guess my answer to the question would be when you see a man who is attempting to be vulnerable, when he's seeking counsel, when he's and he's entering a space where he's saying, I know I need help to berate or to, to badger, to, to lean on him in a way that will then bring his guards back up and make him defensive. The healing won't occur. Yeah. You know, you got to allow that, that wound to scab up and you got to allow him to say and allow the healing process to happen. And if that can happen through love, if that can happen through listening and understanding, because we are kings and queens. We are two powerful, you know, vibrational energies, but we're vibrationally sensitive as well. And when you remove the callus, when you remove the the guards, it's just us that we, we need our women to, in all of all of our faults, all of our wrongs, uh, I, I know I hear all the opinions, I hear all the takes, I hear what I should have did and how I should have been and who I should have been with. But I, I know all of this, but that isn't helping me heal. Yeah. What helps me heal is someone that will listen and say, I see where we are, I'll meet you where you are, and I'm here for you. If that, if the, if women could do that in knowing that yeah, he may not have did the, like, what like you I think you even said we gotta be accountable as men first and foremost. But when we're there attempting to accept the accountability, we need someone there to help walk us through the process to get to the other side of the hill. I, I don't know why this makes me feel like I wanna cry. You know, my son taught me that. My son had an experience where he was um he had to spend some time in God's vacation retreat center. <laughs> Okay. They call prison, <laughs> but I call it God's vacation retreat center because it's such a divine opportunity to retreat to the center of your soul and meet God. Mm. And he wrote me this letter because back then it was collect phone calls. It wasn't like it is now, right. but back then, and I remember this letter. I still have the letter. And this is what he said to me in that letter. Your fears for me were not the fears that I had for myself. 
You gave me enough rope to hang myself and then you beat me up for doing it. You taught me what not to do and what not to be, but never encouraged me into what I could be and, and how to be that. That thing took me to my knees. So when I put him back, I said to him, how can I do it better now? I didn't question it. I didn't challenge it. I didn't judge it. I just said to him, how can I do it better now? And he said to me, stop mothering me and be my friend. Mm. I think that as, as women, if we could see men, I, 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 this is just my experience. Every woman has her own experience. I've been lied to, cheated on, beat. I've been raped. I've been all of that. And that don't have nothing to do with who I am now. Right mm. now, as a woman, I think that if I could see men as my friends first, not as what they're going to buy me, what they're going to do for me, what they're going to give me, how they're going to make me feel and curl my toes and lick my nose and whatever else. You know. <laughs> I'm going to my freaky side. I know you like that. <laughs> but I if, I, if we could just be your friend, but you know what, Nick? Sometimes we're not good friends to each other as women. So mm. it's hard for us to be friends with you as men. You've got sons, right? Yeah, okay. I do. And, and let, me just, let me just go ahead and put this out there because somebody put this in the chat, which is why I, I'm asking the women to be still. Just be still. This is not about you, what I'm getting ready to say, Nick. Not about you at all. It's about somebody's broken heart. So don't mm -hmm. take it on. A woman put in the chat, he got 30 baby mamas. How are he going to help us? Now, she might have a man or want a man in her life, but she's holding that in her heart about you. I'm telling you, she's going to have challenges with her man. That's not about you. That's about mm -hmm. her. But what I would say, again, is what I said to you then. You know, we can't say we believe God is sovereign. We can't believe we say God is in charge. And then not give human beings the opportunity to make mistakes and be redeemed. I believe every soul chooses its lessons, it's, it, the way it's coming in. Your children chose you. They, they chose did. what you have to give them. They chose what they're going to learn. You are giving them exactly what they need to heal, to grow, to learn, to be who they've come. They chose you. And that is no damn body's business. <laughs> There's in God. But that wasn't the question I wanted to ask you. Here's the question. <laughs> I just had to get that off my chest. I appreciate, I appreciate that a woman came into a space for men and put something not ugly out. Tells me she doesn't know who she is because we give birth. Our mouth gives birth. Our heart gives birth. And you put that kind of ugliness out about a brother. I forgive you, my sister. You've got sons. Tell me what you want them to know is the most beautiful thing about being a man. The most beautiful. That's so, again, like I said, I, I know when God is in the room, I know when it's operating because I, I love how you you put it together that way to go from the addressing the comment to that such that wonderful question because I feel like that that actually I can give that answer. Uh, well, I allow the Spirit to work through me to give the, the the correct answer. I'm just a vessel, but the the answer is even in in the criticism. Um, I do know how I can help as a father as the way that I believe I can help because I turn my test into testimonies. I turn my mess into a message. And in these spaces where as men, there are stereotypes that often make us feel small, that often make us feel vulnerable. And even what the definition of a man is, what I wish to show, you know, my seven sons would be it's, it's not what you can physically do. It's not uh, what society may define as a man, but you would truly be the best man that you can be is when you define it for yourself, not based off of society's opinions, not based off others' opinions. Because someone says something so remarkable to me that um, just really just opened my eyes when they were talking about birds. You know, there's a, a chicken is a bird, but so is an eagle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 
And, and it's so interesting that, you know, the way we classify and define, oh, that's, he's just being a bird. Yeah. I, I encourage my sons, ain't nothing wrong with the chicken, but strive to be an eagle. Try to soar above the crows. Try to be the best bird you can possibly be because we define birds in all different kinds, but it's so interesting when uh, they say when the frog judges the ostrich, <laughs> you know, in the sense because ostrich is a bird too, but when someone who isn't even a bird or even a part of that gets to define and say, what can that person do for that classification? I, I truly just say, however you define a man, have the highest frequency in the the greatest vision for yourself and that's what you will become so hopefully i won't tell my son he has to love someone a certain way or he has to uh put himself in certain spaces whatever he defines as a man at its highest frequency that's what a man is and that's the most beautiful man to be well, I want to put a word in for the chickens. I think chickens are very nice birds. I love I them. Do. They <laughs> taste delicious. <laughs> now, when you talk to him and you say to him, this is the most beautiful thing about being a man, defining your manhood for yourself and striving for the highest part of that, what would you tell him is the most challenging part about Ooh. being a man? <laughs> for me right now, in this space, again, I, I think maybe this this will probably constantly change. I mean, as a young man, I know there'll be he, he he's they're dealing with so many things. But as a as a patriarch, as a father, as a, as someone who is the provider and the head of multiple households, um, the pressure, yeah, yeah, the expectation, yeah, um, it's it's a it's a constant challenge. But it's a challenge that I accept. Um, but I have to let them know those challenges are coming. Uh, people are going to look to you. They're going to rely on you. Uh, and, you know, like I always say, uh, I'm going to do my best and let God do the rest. You know, do what I can and let God do what I can't. Um, and and I, I don't say that as just, you know, as a church colloquialism type of vibe. I, I really walk in that. I walk in uh, what I and going back to the book, I think you know, Brother Courtney put it so so beautifully when when he said uh, how therapy uh, introduced him to you know the, the survival, but faith is what got him through, and that he sees God in everything, uh, and he doesn't just he said he used to just get on his knees and pray, uh, but now he's he stands tall and everything that he did takes every moment that he possibly can. And he almost turns his prayer into a constant meditation. And I found that to be so helpful for me uh, to where through these challenges, I just really just, you know, ho hopefully the God energy that exudes in me is what, you know, my sons will see allows me to get through these constant struggles and challenges of being a man. I know you have to leave us. I know you have to leave us, but I, I, I want to say, I want you to just drop one more gem for me, uh, for the young ones, the youngins, you know, those 16, 17, 18, yeah. who you were when my, you first stepped out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you first Absolutely. stepped out, because things have changed so much and they're learning so much, Nick, on social media, mm -hmm. and it's just not true. If you, if every 16, 17, 18 year old, even 13 year old were listening to the Nick Cannon right now, what would you want to say to them? You are loved, you are seen and you matter. Okay. Um, I think that's the thing where with this new generation, they just want to be seen. They want as many followers. They want as many likes. They want, you, you know, even as I, my, my, my oldest son would be 13 in less than 30 days. And and I'm I'm watching him cultivate. I'm watching him, you know, navigate these spaces. And, and I won, I remember, I feel like I was just there. Uh, so I feel like I relate, but I just watch him just wanting to be seen, wanting him to, there's the, the shoes he wears, whether it's the things that he 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 desires, whether it's the, the love from his friends, he just wants to be seen. And it also, it reminds me of a proverb. It's like a child that doesn't feel the love from his village. Uh, 
can burn it down if, just to feel the warmth. Wow. Um, and wow. And I just want them, the, this generation, to know that they are loved. They are seen. They matter. You know. And um, I I share that with my own children. And you know, every time I I step into a room, I try to you know raise the vibration to those people. You know, what I mean, I'm, I'm people don't know. I'm, I'm naturally an introvert, but I know. Yes when I step into a room, I gotta, I gotta bring that energy. Uh, and it's hopefully I'm bringing that energy of, of love and compassion and, and allowing every person, specifically our young people to be seen. Nick Cannon, I know you have to leave us, but if you would just put your hands up for me, I just want to pray for you. Oh, I just want to pray and ask the ancestors, the your greatest, greatest, greatest grandmother and your greatest, greatest, greatest grandfather, all who may sit in the high court of God's source creator. And I ask the highest light of your higher self to cover you, to be with you, to strengthen you, to guide each step that you take, that they put the right thoughts in your mind and point your feet in the right direction second by second, moment by moment, day by day, that you will fulfill not human expectations of you, but God's plan and purpose for you. Nick Cannon, you matter. Nick Cannon, we see you. Nick Cannon, you are loved. And I am forever, ever your auntie. I'm forever grateful that you are here Go forth and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you for this opportunity. Even in this short time that we shared, I, I feel so much healing. I feel I feel seen. So uh, thank you for having me on your platform. And I know we got many other things to announce. We got some stuff that we're building with the community. I'm joining forces with you. You joining forces with me as as uh, May approaches with its mental health month. Uh, you know, so we, we, it's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of counsel to be received. And like I, as I, I've learned, I added an addendum to it, uh, cause from you, but I know we, we, uh, we, we, we feel together so we can, uh, reveal together and deal together so we yeah. can all heal together. All heal together. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> we want to, and wherever you go, encourage the brothers to join, uh, the Invisible Ache book club that we're yeah. starting virtually on uh, April 18th, um, where brothers can come. We're gonna walk through the invisible ache two chapters at a time. So I'm I'll you info so that you can drop it on your guys. Guys don't have to be seen. It's a safe space book club for men so that we can walk through this book together and break it down and right. nibble on it. Okay, kiss Count the baby. And I'm spreading the word. We, we okay, all right. Thank you, my love. Thank you, love you. Love you back. Yeah. Kiss the babies for me. Absolutely. All of them. And I don't All care how them. many you have. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. I will. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nick Cannon and the cancel culture. He's doing an incredible push movement for uh, in May for Mental Health Month um, to support men and really looking at their their selves, their lives, and getting the help that they need. Like I said, to me, it seems like men are allergic <laughs> to asking for help. Um, and so I'm just so glad for what he's doing. And, and I have to tell you, as someone in the public eye, as someone in the entertainment world, if, if you speak, don't, don't be fooled by appearances. Don't let what you see on television and whether he's on the, uh, what is the thing he does? Uh, I can't remember the show. Listen, I'm old. I can't remember. <laughs> wilding out, wilding out and all the other things that, he's, that he does. Don't let that fool you. This is an incredible soul who's doing some incredible work and he owns himself. That is, that's what I love. Okay. All right. So as he said, to, to be a man and, and be to the highest standard of that, even if you're a chicken man, that would be a rooster. <laughs> I can't let them put down the chicken. I'll, I will really, you know, hold up the, the eagle and the ostrich, but I do love a chicken. OK, we are here for one purpose and one purpose only. Um, to support black men in identifying their pain and reclaiming their power. And if you're here and you're not a black man, if you're a white man, a Latin man, an indigenous man, you are welcome. 
but I want to honor what Courtney's experience is. And writing this, I'm sure he wasn't eliminating men, but not being arrogant enough to speak for them. He is a black man and he he poured his heart out. I can't even say he put his foot in it. I have to say he poured his heart out in this book, The Invisible Ache. We're here to share with him and his co-author, Dr. Robin L. Smith, a renowned uh, clinical psychologist who I've known for many, many, many years. And, and let me just say to you, it's, it's, it's so funny. Uh, and this is how you know when you're in spirit and when you're in, in love. Um, I, I've seen Courtney B. Vance on every screen, everywhere for most of my life, as long as I can remember. And when we finally connected, we were talking like we had known each other since we were in pups in the park. <laughs> like we just knew each other and just went all talking and, and having uh, a conversation about the invisible egg, his experience, our experiences. And it was just a beautiful thing. No pretenses, no um, upset. It was just, it was just beautiful. And Dr. Robin, Dr. Robin knew me in my other life. <laughs> she knew me before I became Iyama all grown up when I was still in bad behavior and not, not acting in my highest and greatest self. So they are both here with us. We also have here with us tonight, uh, Dr. Steve Perry. Uh, you may know Dr. Steve Perry from his show on BET. Um, I'm going to say it wrong. I want to say daddy's home, but that's not it. Lord, I don't know why I didn't write myself some notes, but you all know me. Um, <laughs> uh, and he's, he is the founder. See, he, he knew there was a problem in education and he didn't wait for anybody to fix it. This brother went out and opened two charter schools, one in Harlem, one in Hartford, Connecticut, and sending young people from high school into college. Dr. Steve Perry is going to join us later and also uh, renowned spiritual life coach, Robert Pruitt is going to be with us. But I wanna to bring to the stage, uh, the co-authors, um, my brother, just love him, honor him, respect him. I hope you all are watching his new show, 69th Street or 68th Street or one of the 60s, he's doing the show and y'all need to watch that. Courtney B. Vance. And 61st Street. And well, I was on the wrong block. He was close. <laughs> you in the wrong, you in the right city, but wrong. Block. Wrong block. Yeah, yeah. And this Dr. Robin L. Smith, we're gonna welcome her to the stage so that we can get into this conversation about the invisible egg. Hi, Dr. Robin. Hello there, my sister. How are you? It's on the wrong street. <laughs> Wait, that, listen, you're on the, right the wrong street, but but you're on in the right on the right planet. Yeah, That's right. right. What's up, Hi, my sister from the different? Hello there, my brother. How are you? Wonderful, thank God. Good Wonderful. to be with the two of you. This is um, good to be black. Yeah, it's a it's a blessing. So thank you, Sister Yanla, for this this moment. I told you that I was going to do my best to get every eyeball in a male head to read this book. And so I'm going to do it. I'm yes. going to do it. You know, we're getting ready to start the book club, but I wanted your voice, your fingerprint on it. Courtney, Amen. talk to us about your invisible ache. I, I, well, I think, mm -hmm. go ahead. You know, I, you know, Doc. I just, I didn't know that I had one. Mm. You know, and I think that's, you know, if you're in, you know, and it, no matter what circle you're in, you know, and I was in the achieving circle. Okay. You know, um, you know, and, and uh, my parents were um, middle to lower. Uh, uh, income kind of uh, area. We lived in Detroit and um, a scholarship to a, a private school um, that we couldn't afford, but they, they stressed and struggled and got me there. And I recognized my responsibility while I was there and I excelled. So and then, you know, Harvard came next and Yale School of Drama when I discovered acting and, you know, fences and I was off and running. And that was able to, to, I was able to hide and protect myself um, from whatever. I, I sensed in the household there was something going on, but I had to go back to school. I had to go back to work. So I was able to always 
But if you live long enough, Dr. Robin, if you live long enough, you're going to come up against yourself sitting on the edge of the bed at two in the morning. And you better know somebody then. You better know him to be able to call on him when you are in stress or stressed. And, um, you know, I was able to, the village surrounded me. I was able to find, you know, a, you know a, a therapists to be able to sit down and afford to even sit down with one, um, uh, much less uh, be with uh, one for three years. And so, you know, the, the, the ache, I guess, was just about being, being black and dealing with, you know, in the, in the circles that you would think that I had it all going on. Um, but as I sat on the edge of my, uh, uh, of the outside Dr. Kornfeld, was my therapist's name, Kornfeld's office in Gramercy Park, if you know anything about Gramercy Park, it's a park, but the park is locked. <laughs> Only the people whose apartments, buildings surround the park who have the key can get in. So there's nowhere to sit. So I'm sitting on the stoop waiting because if uh, waiting for the, uh, I was early because if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Late. Okay. Y'all get that tomorrow. And so I was waiting for my session and I was sitting there on the stoop and I'm just one step and I'm sitting there and the white people all pass me by looking down at me, clutching pearls and making a big banana going around me and carrying on and I just went into my therapy session I was just like I feel so terrible I don't think I'm anything and then she said Courtney you're on top of the world you're 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 in the, the biggest play on Broadway you what do you mean you can and that's where we began you know just filling in the blanks of and if if I'm Harvard Yale you know, you know Broadway you know and, and I'm feeling like that you can imagine what people, folks who ain't had any kind of pedigree feel it's awful, and if you don't feel that there's anywhere to go, anywhere to turn, you ain't got, you can't afford therapy. Doctor Robin, jump in here. If you can't afford, what do you do? Where do you go? How do you, how do you feel? How do you fill the void? Miss Doctor Robin, here's my, here's my question for you. Yes. How does a man know he has an ache if it's invisible and inauditable? Yeah. Because some of them don't even have words to give to what that is. Yes. What, what did they do? What, where did they begin? You know, I, I want to start um, by, you said something when you were introducing us about how long you and I have known each other and the journey we have been on together, whether we saw each other, we didn't see each other. And I want to use that because we grew up together. Yeah. We matured together. We stumbled together. Yes. Um, and I say that because as we're talking about the invisible ache, um, Sister Iyanla, we have all uh, behaved in ways that we didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And part of the invisible ache about Black men is when you're asking, how do I identify something that I can't see? that I can't hear. It's almost asking, how do we uh, know God? However, we understand that, who we cannot see uh, in the natural and we cannot hear necessarily in the natural, but we have an experience of the spiritual. And so what I would say is, and Courtney, I, I wanna just add for people who don't know about your story that Courtney's father, uh, 34 years ago died by suicide. Uh, we don't use committed suicide because suicide is not a crime. Yes. Uh, our ache is not a crime. It's actually life's way of getting our attention. And then Courtney's godson four years ago um, died 23 years young of suicide as well. So in case people don't know, as Courtney is talking about being on top of the world, 34 years ago and getting that call from his mother that his father had died, we're talking about an ache that seemed like it had to do with his father's death only. And of course it was related to that, but he said something about being a black man. And so I want to invite black men and all men, but black men in particular and boys, to ask yourself, not do I hurt, but where does it hurt? So when you're saying, how do I know that I have an ache that I can't see? 
Well, a lot of times we haven't even felt the birthright to ask, where do I hurt? And I have found that when black men are asked and boys about not do you hurt, and not does it hurt you to be followed in a store as if you're going to steal something? Not does it hurt you to be marginalized? Not does it hurt you to be called a dog when you are actually a grand human being? But where does it hurt? And you're inviting yourself tonight, Black boy or Black man, to take yourself and your pain seriously in a way that quite possibly no one knew to ask, where do you hurt? Yeah, yeah. Courtney, I, I wanna ask you a question because as a mom, as a mom of a beautiful, powerful uh, black man, I, I, he has, he, first of all, he taught me how to pray. <laughs> Cause I had to get on my knees for that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he also has taught me so much uh, when I stopped mothering him and, and became his friend and let him be an adult man in my presence. Now, you may not have had this experience, Courtney, but if you can speak to it, how sometimes as mothers, we either ignore, dismiss, deny, miss our son's ache. Sometimes we cause it. I caused my son's ache. I, I own it. I've asked for forgiveness. I caused his ache. One. Mm -hmm. How how what do as a as a father, what do we as mothers need to do so we can be a little more sensitive to either creating the ache or addressing the ache? You know, I I, I so appreciate us being here and talking. Um, you know, it, it just <clears throat> you know, the, the main thing is acknowledging. You know, because there are no perfect marriages, there's no perfect mommies, no perfect daddies. Everybody's doing the best they can with what they got. Our parents did the best they could. You did the best you could yeah. with what you had. And but and just acknowledging, baby, I'm sorry. I, I could have done better, but where I was at the time, that's the best I, I could do. So all I can do now is apologize. And now 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 it's on me. It's on me to recover, to go about doing the work of recovery. Um, so I, you know, I, the, the, the past is the past, and the present is, what am I going to do, with what somebody has acknowledged, mm -hmm. Dr. Mm -hmm. Robin, or not acknowledged? Mm -hmm. Now, if they're not going to acknowledge what they, what their hand in it was, I still, it's still on, on my soul, and I, it's a, it's a burden on me. I've got to still, you going to have sometimes you got to tell people, including your, your, your blood relatives, you're going to tell them, I love you, but I'm going to love you from a distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody can't be in my inner circle. And you, we have to guard that. that it's, I, I look at it like a target. And if you're going to do, you know, shoot and target, there's this inner circle, a circle outside the inner circle, a circle outside that circle, and a circle way outside. Sometimes you got to folks have to gently push folk up to the, up to the, the top circle. And tangentially, hey, how you doing? I was wondering if we can get together. Mm -hmm. I'm a little busy right now. Thank you, though. I appreciate you. So, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, my, my mother and father, did, were they perfect? Hey, hell no. You know, did they do everything that I wish? I mean, as I said, a lot of times, I didn't know what I could have asked for. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. you know, that's how I was raised. And, you know, um, you know and, and our children, Brown and Slater, who are about to go to college, you know, they're finishing up their senior year, they're about to go to college, they're going to be in the midst of that, too. And when they get around, you know, folks and from all, not only from different parts of the, the city, different states, different countries, they're going to be, they, they have an international student as a, as a roommate. And, you know, you're going to be weighing and judging, and you know, what their parents did versus what, you know, their, what my parents did. And ultimately, you know, I, I've got, I, I'm all in. I, we, I, Mommy and I, Angie and I did the best we could do with them. And we gave them education. We gave them, number one, we gave them Jesus. We gave them education. We gave them discipline. We gave them love. Not necessarily in that order, but definitely Jesus first. And so that's all you need to go out and make a way in this world. 
Was it perfect? Please. Because we ain't perfect. But that's what you got. Now what you gonna do? Dr. Robbins, let me ask you this. Um, and, and this is really for the man. I, I know as a woman, one of the very deep, deep, deep wounds is a mommy wound. What does a man do with a mommy wound? When he's because that's his heart, yeah. What does he do when he's trying to make his way in the world and it's invisible? Because in our community, you don't talk bad about your mama, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, that question and what you asked Courtney as well, and he said about acknowledgement. So, the fact that your son had the privilege of a mother who could see herself at some point and see that his struggles were connected to your struggles. Mm. There is something so powerful and painful about having a mother who can acknowledge that where she was hurt, she turned around and hurt you. And hurt you could be that she was afraid that there are many black mothers right now who are trying to keep their black boys and husbands alive. Yes. So that can come out as aggression. It can come out. So the fear can manifest as anger and aggression and harshness. And so what I want to invite black men to recognize, this is not about, you know, forgive your mother so you can be free. It's about understand quite possibly that what you are longing and aching for mm. from your mother, she couldn't give it to you because of where she herself was stuck, is still stuck quite possibly. And so I know, you know, my mother died four years ago and I would talk about her, the ways in which she was wonderful. And I also would tell people in front of, you know, thousands of people about where my mother and I struggled. And I said to my mother, and I, I want to say this to every black man and boy who is listening, who feels that to be a good man, he must be completely loyal and loyal, meaning that he must swallow his own pain Mm. about what he did not get that he needed from his mother or father. And so one of the things I did is I told my mother, because my grandmother was living at the time, there were five generations, so I could watch where the mess happened. Uh, not only the miracles, but I could see where people got stuck in my family. And I said to my mother, I said, Mommy, I want you to know something. If you expect me to do with you, what you have done with grandmommy, you can fail me now mm. because I'm not going to run around uh, and try and please someone who can't be pleased and, and, and hunger for something that I can't get from that person. And so I would just encourage every black man and man and boy who are listening right now to recognize that your freedom is not in whether or not your mother can see you. Mm. It's whether or not you can see yourself. I mean, that's that's like 10 toes down. You know mm. what I mean? That, that's a 10 toe. This is not, it's nice when we have a mother, Ianlo, who can come to us like you did with your son and say, my bad, and I'm sorry, and I'd like to repair. But I want men tonight to recognize that it is your divine birthright to see where you hurt, even if you have a mother who cannot tolerate to see your pain, to see your humanity. Yeah. 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 You, and that thing about, I'll say this. Yes. You can heal even if your father, your mother, your whoever raised you, if they don't acknowledge it at all. Absolutely. If don't acknowledge it, you can still heal. Thank you. We got you back, Courtney. Absolutely. I, I, want, you, I, want, to, I want you to, the Audre Lord, who I love dearly, said that self-care is yes. not self-indulgent. It, it isn't. It is really, uh, it's necessary. 
you yeah. know, it is self um preservation. Self -preservation. Yes. yes. Self preservation. And you talk a lot about that, Courtney. Can you share with us a how therapy is a form of self-care? And then what are the other forms of self-care that men can do until they work themselves up ready to go to therapy? <laughs> you know, um, you know, the, the, you have to begin, I, I believe, um, ladies, I think we all have to begin where we are. You know, I, I you know, the, the the biggest step I think I found was just when my mother, my sister and I, Cecily, uh, my who's my heart, she's two years uh, my elder, and uh, uh, I remind her of that quite often. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, we we went back home to take care of our mother, get her help, get the, her, her affairs in order. It took us about a month, and when we were about to leave, mommy pulled us aside and said, "Now before you get into your, you know, head on back in the U-Haul." Um, to your two cities, Maryland and, and Manhattan. She said, I'd like you all, and I'll do the same thing here in Detroit, find therapists mm. in their respective cities. And mm. we were a little... Shocked. <laughs> okay, we were a little... Clutching of okay. pearls. <laughs> we, and so I, I had never, you know, even thought about, because I was so busy achieving they had instilled that in me and uh and my sister i think i think my sister you know ran away from home a couple of times so she may have been more not so you know she may have been hmm, okay i was you know so you know it, it, but but she challenged us and you know i i was really you know that if my mother hadn't asked me to i wouldn't have known that i needed to so i wouldn't have done it okay i would have been struggling but I wouldn't have known what to do. But because she asked us to do that, I had to do it. So um, you know that that it 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 and it and it began to you know. Then when I found that everyone you know, the village started to surround me. I I got five and six and seven. I got so many therapists. I got and the therapists are at that time were like a hundred dollars a pop to sit just sit down and talk to them for a minute. So, you know, it was, it's, you know, I, I think the first step is just to acknowledge, you know, maybe what Courtney and Dr. Robin were saying, maybe I could talk to somebody. But again, I, I didn't know I needed to. So if my mother hadn't asked me to, I, I would have, as my, my uh, our, our twins say, I would have thugged it out. You know, I would have just, you know, I don't know. I don't know what else to do, but, you know, just keep pushing like I've been pushing and hopefully I'll, you know, you know, but, but I was able to, you know, I finally found, uh, you know, Dr. Kornfeld, uh, you know, Jewish lady and Dr. Robin talked to you about it. We, you know, we think that we got to have a black therapist or Christian therapist or whatever, you know, I just, Dr. K, I shook her hand. And I was like, this is my person. Yeah. I knew as soon as I shook her hand. And, you know, then she started to gently over the course of, you know, of course, the first session, I was talking a mile a minute because I, I didn't, you know, I was just like, Grrr. she said, Courtney, you don't have to tell me everything today. <laughs> and, um, you know, so over the course of, you know, the next few sessions, she was, she would, uh, Dr. Robin, though, she would start to ask me, you know, Courtney, how do you make decisions? You know, just, just, you know, trying to see where I am. I said, well, I do like everybody does, Doc. I, you know, I just, I flip a coin, right? Right? The, isn't that what, no? Everybody doesn't do that? Oh. So, Courtney, do you have the patience to let the mud settle in the water and the water become clear? Hmm. I said, clear waters run deep. What you talking about? I, I don't know nothing about that, Willis. I don't know nothing about that. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. And she said, okay. All right. You know, for some things, you know, some things you, some things you just got to let, simmer on the stove a little bit. I said, now, Courtney, do you, I'd like you to get your dreams. Do you dream? And I said, I don't, I don't dream. What, where is this coming? You know, so I, but she challenged me. Don't challenge a brother. <laughs> I said, and long story, I got, you know, ended up with 35 dreams, came to her, bam. 
She said, okay, achieving black man. Very good, very good. Very good. Now, you know, come back with one, you know, and then we'll work off of that. And so for the next three years, we worked directly off my dreams. And that was, you know, again, Docs, I didn't know anything. All I knew was that my mother asked me because, you know, I didn't know I was in crisis. Mm. I, you know, I, my father died, but I didn't die, so I'm good, right? I'm, you know, I'm just doing, I'm doing it, right? I'm, you know, I'm good. Meanwhile, my life is crumbling around me, mm. but I'm still good because I'm, I'm, I'm good. And so, thank God, I mean, that's the message, I guess, Doc. I guess that's the message. Don't wait for your good to be bad before you realize you ain't good. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I also, there's, um, Courtney's mother, there's a quote that I use. It's an African uh, proverb that says, the lion's story will never be known as long as the hunter is the one to tell it. Mm. And so a part of what we're also talking about is how do you become the narrator of your own story? Okay. How do you recognize that sometimes the, as we say, again, the lion's story will never be known as long as the hunter is the one to tell it. Sometimes we think the hunter is outside of us. Yes. And sometimes it is. But also there is a hunter on the inside. And there is a hunter who is stalking us to go silent on ourselves the way the world has done, to deny ourselves our wholeness. So I say we all have holes, H-O-L-E-S, longing to be whole, W-H-O-L-E, which is a holy, H-O-L-Y journey. And so a part of this is how do I honor my holes as part of, again, my birthright to be human. I mean, that men who aren't crying don't recognize that their tears are their teacher and they have earned the right to cry. They have earned the right. And so as we call men back into their bodies, I say this is like an altar call, an old fashion altar call, not where you are coming down to meet God, but you are coming down to meet yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are coming down to reclaim that boy or that man who was stolen, who was taken from you, who was kidnapped. You know, we talk about being kidnapped from Africa and there was no amber alert put out mm. for us. So the invisible ache is an amber alert. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is saying, I'm going to go and claim, you know, unclaimed money, unclaimed furniture. I'm going to go and claim me, not because someone else says that I'm worth it, but because I have decided that I am worthy and worth it. And that is a form of self care. Absolutely. Just giving yourself permission to say, I am worthy and worth my own time, energy, yes. attention, and resources. While you're here, I hope I can do this. I want to bring up with us Dr. Steve Perry because Dr. Steve Perry works with the little ones. Are you there, Steve? Let me see. Uh, he works with the little ones. You know, he has two um, charter schools. Yeah. And so five, that's what's counting. Five? <laughs> Well, excuse me, excuse me. What's up, Dr. P? Hey, Brother Vance. Hey, Sister Hello Smith. How are you doing? Good to be with I you. I like the bow tie. You're rocking that bow tie. I'm in my work clothes still. Doctor, don't push it down. Lift that thing up. Come on now. No, 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 no. I got it. It came up higher than it was supposed to. Disproportionate. Okay. Now, here's a question for you before I line it. And before we get into the, the meat of it, did you tie that or was that a clip on? Oh, come on, man. It's only one way. This is. Come on, man. Is, Was that we... paid, Courtney? <laughs> uh, there ain't, ain't nothing behind that but, but tying. <laughs> Dr. Steve, you, you heard Dr. Courtney, you heard uh, Dr. Robin. You're looking at it at its, its 
roots, you're looking at it at the very early stages. What do you say to mothers, fathers, us, the community, about how we need to identify, first of all, how do you see the youngins aching? Because I know you see it, we talk about it. They are in excruciating pain. Um, we have crossed into a, a very, very dark space. Um, there are things that we're seeing in children that I used to have to wait for teenage years to see. Um, we're seeing it in elementary school all the way back to kindergarten there are behaviors that we're seeing that are very, very troubling. And I'm going to give you the full report from the front lines. And there's a vocabulary now around mental health that was not present before. Uh, people don't use words like you just crazy. They don't speak in those ways. So even in some of the most guttural circumstances, children are aware of the necessity for mental health support. There's an even greater need for it. What I'm also seeing are parents who are either unwilling or un incapable of dealing with some pretty profound uh, mental health disabilities, um, significant and frightening at times. They take stuff that is just kids stuff and they turn it into something catastrophic and violent. So there, the report from the front lines is that it's rough out here. It's really, really, really rough out here. And um, we need help immediately. Send troops. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Robin. You know, I was going to say my um, dissertation a long time ago was on rites of passage for manhood training for adolescent black boys. And what the research showed was that the manhood training wasn't what mattered um, in the significant way. What mattered is that these boys felt seen. And part of what I hear you saying, Dr. Perry, has so much to do with how invisible children feel. I watch parents who are so distracted and not to blame them, but they don't know that when their child is tugging on them at the post office or in the supermarket to get their attention, how, how deeply um, significant it is for a child to be seen by their primary caregiver. And so I, I think, think when you talk about the troops, I mean, send in the troops, it is also acknowledging that invisibility is like soul murder. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's there's a bastardization that's been going on for quite some time of what it means to be a man. What it means to be a man has always been to be less than human, right? If you take the word human, we cut off the hue and we're just man. And and what we lose in the in the shortening of the word is the limited access to the full range of emotionality. You know, I was speaking at a uh, at a uh, in an HBCU actually, and I was talking to some young ladies, and they were talking about how, you know, how they want an intelligent hoodlum, and I'm like, what? what I don't really know what that means. Like, wait, what, where where are we going with this, sis? And this young lady was saying that she wanted somebody who could protect her, and for her, the protection was through the through a form of physical protection, and. What she was trying to do was intellectualize her own emotional limitations and, and not understanding that she's putting that on this boy. This yeah. boy thinks that in order to attract her, he's got to step outside of his own feelings and be someone who's ready to do physical battle, which mm -hmm. to what end it, it, does that? This is a young man who's in college. Like, what, fight who for what? Yeah. Like, what, what, why? Like, what, what are we fighting I mean, it's not like something. So maybe if, if if we have a broader conversation about what it means still to be a man, uh, that, you know, few are the women who want to sit next to a man in the movie theater and watch Brother Vance move them to tears. Right. That's not what you want on that first date. Like, man, wow. you better pull yourself together. You, you do a cry. I'm as a woman. She see that. And so we, we see we hear often 
women say that they want men to be more emotive, but don't know what to do with those emotions when they come. Wow. You hear women talk about that they want men to be able to express themselves. But when a man is in a process of expressing himself in the way that he does, which is a slower burn with a lot less words, like if, if Brother Vance and I were somewhere and, and I'd say, how you how you doing? He'd say, I'm good. And that would be the whole entire story. I would understand <laughs> and that right there. What he meant by that, and that would be the whole story. Whereas when we talk to a woman and we say we're good, she it's just not enough for her. Like, what do you mean? Why do you mean? What did I do? What did I do wrong? I, I didn't do nothing to you, and it turns into an argument. We have to understand that the definition of manhood is still developing, especially black manhood. And if we don't give men the space to come with their emotions at the time that they are ready, then we are imparting we are intruding and breaking the ranks of his emotional sanctity in every single house a young man or father has a space where they hide from the women that they love <laughs> there's a man cave there's the boy's room there's the bathroom a, man, a, a father will stay in the bathroom be like bro what are you doing in there hiding yeah i don't feel like talking right now to any of y'all <laughs> and and what is so important about that, and, and Courtney and I talk about this in The Invisible Ache, is for women and yes. Black women to understand our role in either advancing the conversation and the safety or bringing harm to our sons and to our partners. And so Black women can get very upset with me. Like, well, what do you mean? I mean, I, I'm the one who's there and I'm saying, but how you just came at me, if that's how you are coming at him. How did you just put that thing in the thing about Nick? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to call that out. I'm no, sorry. No, no. Yeah, no, no. So, I, I mean, I think it's important that we as women check ourselves. You know, who's going to check me, boo? Well, we need to, right, Boo needs to check Boo. And so this is really what you're saying, Dr. Perry, so critical for women to understand the ways in which they are pushing their sons and their significant others away. Yeah, Courtney, what, let me ask Courtney a question. Courtney, when you yes, were, and we, we talked about this, but when you were at the, in the crux of your healing process, and we know you have a partner, what did she or didn't she do that made you safe? Well, she, she let me be. Say that. <laughs> Say less, right? Say less. She, she yeah, that's, me, that's it right there. You know, and I had to recognize eventually to leave her be. Mm. And let God begin to bring us how to become one is a mystery. And you know, I was I was invading her space and you know, you need to do how come you not and and you know, just ended up gave myself a a, a nervous breakdown or you know, trying to, you know, with my spirit of excellence. And uh, my godly counselor at the time said, You know what, Court? She's good. She's Good. That's who you marry. Mm. Now, what you gonna do? Mm. And I had to recognize that while God was doing working on her, He's working on me. And I had to listen and learn because she was women watching. She was watching me to see if I was the man I said I was. Mm. She was just, she wasn't doing nothing. She wasn't giving nothing. She wasn't showing nothing. And I was like, well, she ain't giving nothing, showing nothing. There's something wrong. I said, no, God said, ain't nothing wrong. What you doing? Hmm. So at some point, somebody's got to be the one to lead with grace. And she's watching me. And if you're going to be the head, be the head with being saying I'm sorry, even mm. though you don't think you did anything. But but I had to recognize 
the divine order. God is first. My wife is second. The children the third. Work is fourth. And I am fifth. Once I've recognized that my prayers, First Peter, live with a woman according to knowledge, that she is a weaker vessel, not weaker in terms of strength, but emotional. And that your prayers are not hindered. Once I heard that, wait a minute, you're telling me that if I don't cater to her emotional needs, my all the prayers that I got are going to be mm, blocked. I said, I got it, baby. What you need me to do? <laughs> honey, do. <laughs> what, what you need me to do? Honey and do. we joke about it, honey, do, blah, blah, blah. But I, I, I recognized and understood the power of submission. What can I do? Not just, and it starts with her, but then it went on. Because I was, I was in prep mode for when the children came. So they saw me, they see me. My, what else? Honey, you need Hey, y'all get yourself together. Come on over here. We love you. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Say good morning to your mother. Say good morning. Okay. So they see that not only you say it, but doc, Dr. Robert, you got to do it. You got to show it. Because they don't care. After a certain point, they don't listen to what you say. They listen, but they know what you just did. Doc, am I right about it? Well, yeah. And I think what's also important is that um, Courtney is not telling black men or boys to put themselves aside yeah. and not care for themselves. Cause someone could hear that and think, Oh, mm -hmm. I'm just like the last person to be remembered. And what you're talking about is you found ways to nourish yourself. Mm. You went to the altar Mm. and claimed you. And so as you mm. were able to fill your own tank, you mm. had more to give to everyone else. And that's a part of what I want us to remember, that we can want to love on someone, but when we're on the plane and they say, in the event of an emergency, what do you do? You put your own mask on first so that you then can do what be useful of service yep yep I'm a kindergarten more. teacher Hold on, I'm a kindergarten yeah. teacher let me do this real quick because y'all oh, are just right. these gyms and they're popping all over the place okay. go to commercial. first of all how to be with a black man when he's in his ache and healing let him be let yes. him be don't talk him out of it what I know is sometimes you being in upset, you being in distress frightens me. And so rather than acknowledge my fear, I'm going to try to, you know, beat you out of it. Ladies, did you hear that? That's number one. Number two, what I hear you saying, uh, Dr. Robin, is let him fill his holes so that you can come together in wholeness and holiness. Now, I just yes. made that up. Is that what you're saying? Okay. No, that, no you didn't make that up. You're, yeah, that's the mirror. Yes. <laughs> Can I, uh, 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 Sister Young, I wanted to say, so, so when my wife and I were boyfriend and girlfriend um, back in Philly, I had just finished graduate school, and I had spent hey, a lot of time hey, trying. I, <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time trying not to be like I had seen my father be. Um, a lot of the things that I'd seen him do, the way I'd seen him move in relationships, I wanted nothing to, I wanted to nothing like that. I didn't want to be hollering at women or, or more going even further than that. I didn't want to live that life. And so I, I avoided relationships where I felt like things could get aggressive, people hollering and screaming at each other. And um, not long after we started dating, we had an argument and it was an argument, like a real argument. And um, I remember thinking, I am going to leave this woman. This is not for me um, because I can see where this is going. And if we're starting here, if this is the starting point, then it can only go further. And um, trying to intellectualize the, the things, this is predates uh, um, an email. Uh, I had, I wrote her a note and in the note, I don't remember all that I said, but I ended with saying, I am looking for a warm, comfortable place. And 
what that meant to me then is what it has meant to me now. Even though I was only 25 years old, what I was asking for, for was the space to come up with what I needed to say. I may not be in a position to communicate through the pain, frustration, or hurt. And if you press me, you're going to position me into my most guttural, aggressive mm. man space. And so often I find that women want a reaction so quickly because they want to talk through their emotions where in many cases, many men want to think through their emotions. They want the space that they don't care what they get as long as they get a reaction. And so now 25 years later, we're still trying to work to the uh, warm, comfortable place. But the point is that we now have a much better understanding of each other's emotional needs. And I think that where when many women then become mothers of sons, they feel like they don't have to wait for the same thing that they have to wait for, for their husband or male partner, that they can just boom, that's my room. I'll kick the door and I want to talk now and tell me why. And, it, and, and, and then the boy is but a small man. He has the same emotions going. And he's also trying to come to a place where he feels a warm, comfortable place mm -hmm. where he can come up with his thoughts. He can, he can discern whether this, he can develop the emotional language that he needs in order to communicate what's going on with him. He doesn't want to just say, I'm mad. But if that's only, if that's all you give him time to say, that is what he's going to say. And then he's going to double down on that rage. And then that's going to become something explosive as opposed to pushing back from the table and saying, when you're ready to talk, we'll talk. Courtney, I, will, I, will listen. Ian, I just want to say something just quickly. Dr. Perry, thank you for sharing that. The other piece of that is for when you talk about rage is not just a black man who is aggressive, but it is also the black man who shuts down. Mm. So, so I just want to remind us that there are many ways to opt out of a moment. And it could be to be aggressive and volatile. And it also could be to shut down and go within. And so I just want to hold up that other side that is a defense that men are using to simply survive environments that don't feel safe. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Robin. I want to bring to the stage Dr. Robert Pruitt. Uh, I, I put you back in the room, Steve. I'll come get you in a minute. <laughs> um, but Dr. Robert Pruitt, uh, Robert Pruitt, is a father of twin sons. But Whitney, I, I wanted to come back to you for a minute. Does the invisible ache sometimes render you speechless? Uh, uh, is that for me? Yeah, yeah that's you. Oh, I was saying, does I, the I some, Yeah. I hear some. I know. Yeah. He's, I think maybe me? Coach Robert, I don't know. If you are just. Are I don't you, have you, No, it's not your mute because I muted myself and it didn't stop. Um, Let me mute myself. Oh, it's, now you, it's. <laughs> Yeah, it was you. <laughs> so, Courtney, maybe you come on and let's see. Okay. Yeah. Are you still muted? No, I'm not. Okay, okay there you go. Whatever it was, okay. it's gone. Now. I scared it away. <laughs> hey, Coach. <laughs> uh, what, 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 what did you give me? Was does can the invisible ache? sometime render you speechless as a man well i you know yes i mean that the you, you know i, I don't know i don't know what to do at times and that, and that's why you know following up on the the discussion that we were just having you know that that you know how to become one is a mystery and but somebody's got to lead it somebody's got to lead you mm -hmm. with love into that 
space that we talked about, that warm, fuzzy space where two people start competing to do for each other. Yeah. And initially, I'm, I'm waiting for her and she's waiting for me. And eventually, and eventually, we both get tired of waiting and say, what's wrong with you? And it turns into something. And that's when I, I recognized that I said, she's fine. And I had my little breakdown. And I, then I realized, I, I said, I needed a word. So I just started focusing on reading that word. And all of a sudden, she, she started seeing me not focused on her and what she was not doing. I was doing all the things that I, I know she loved and I know she liked flowers in the house. I know she was shopping and cooking and I was doing other, you know, some going, doing my jobs and you know, bringing my money in. I'll never make more money than Angela Bassett. So it's not about the money. Okay, it's not about the money. It's about really, she recognizes that she's number one. Mm. Number two, actually. God is number one. Number two. So she recognizes that. And then, then, then when she, then she started, when she knew me, she said, I see you, the man that you said you were. Then she started to, Courtney, what you doing? Oh, nothing, baby. I'm just reading a little bit here. Yeah, do, do you want to come get something to eat? Oh, 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 you made something to eat? Oh, oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, the whole nature of the relationship, and it wasn't because I made it happen. It was because I stopped focusing on what she wasn't doing. Okay. And started focusing on what I needed to do for her, and then she's all of a sudden, baby, stop! You know, you know, I, we're trying to get pregnant, and you know, you know, IVFs, five or six of them. I was like, and, and, but I wanted just baby for you, Courtney. So it, then all of a sudden, we're in this other space that that it could have gone, young, it could have gone the complete opposite way. But I was, it's that that really fine area coach. Where you really you 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 the relationship could go either way. Where I'm saying she's not the right person for me because she's too volatile, or she's too this, or she's too that. Doctor Robin, you know what I'm saying? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it it really if you're gonna be the man, you know, whoever you're gonna be with, you gotta do some work. I don't care yes. if the most perfect person in the world for you, you gonna have to do some work because life yeah. is about work. It's not about having fun. And the honeymoon after the honeymoon is over, it's work. What you gonna do? Dr. Robin, my beloved Courtney B. Vance, I know that y'all have a heart out. I want to talk to you, Coach Robert. Uh, I mean, you know, the father of twin sons. I want to talk to you about that. Um, but I want to make sure Courtney and Dr. Robin get no, that. No, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have a heart out, but I'm, I want to hear Coach. Okay. I, wanna, uh, I, wanna, I was going to say, Robin, we, got... we would love to hear Coach. Iyana, can I just say something from Dr. Perry and um, that Courtney just said? We're also talking about women learning. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, we're also talking about women learning how to manage our own anxiety. Because okay. I just want to remind us that some of what women are doing with their sons and doing with their partners, and Dr. Perry said this, has to do with their own anxiety. And instead of being able to say, what do I need to do to take care of my anxiety? It is not his job. It is not my son's responsibility. How do I, as a woman, take care and find ways to quiet my inner turmoil, my fears, yeah. that I don't dump all of that toxicity onto the men and the boys in my life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Coach Robert, Coach. two sons gone off to college now. I know that they were, you were a single dad and I watched you as a dad. Did you see, no feel, identify your son's ache? Absolutely. And I identified it in two ways. One, I could see the reflection of my own life's experience showing up in them. So it gave me an opportunity to heal without overcorrecting. And what I mean by that is without imposing my journey on them and creating a fear in them that had nothing to do with their journey. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So yes. the little boy in me, while the man, if you will, the adult was attempting to adult and figure this thing out, 
uh, needed to be mindful that my experience with my father was my experience with my father. So I don't want to you know, create an expectation in my relationship with my sons that's unrealistic. Uh, I just got a text message. Uh, one of my sons is at Howard and the other one's at Stevenson. Aiden sent me a message yesterday that said, I just want to let you know that I love you and I appreciate you for showing me and instilling in me serving others. Amen. Okay. <laughs> got it. But let, but let me be real clear. If we just take the last nine months and I go with where Courtney went, mm. the rearranging of the order. And I love what mm. you say, Ian. You know, we call it bad behavior, but sometimes we only know it as behavior. <laughs> we don't know idealistically whether it's bad or good. And I remember turning to my wife in the midst of turmoil, because you, know, you know I don't pull no punches. And I said, okay, here's what I'm aware of. I said yes to you and then put God on the side. So think of us having climbed a mountain. We're stuck put the rope around the two of us and I'm trying to throw it up to God instead of the reverse, which is allowing God to throw the rope down. And I mm. tie up. I'm thinking mm. I've got us, but I dismiss God. So this is a place for me to find out where is that being mirrored back? Well, I could look at my sons and mm. see where you talked about a little while ago, caring for oneself and clearer now because I've used self care in kind of an intellectual way. I thought it was profound, but I understand in the last nine months it was intellectualized. Which self am I caring for? The self that's operating out of fear because there's some healing that is required. There are some hurts that are unexpressed. There are some doubts that are present. There's an opportunity to reframe the paradigm around manhood, which is what Courtney brought up or what Dr. Perry brought up. You know, this part of me that may say, hey, you aren't the right one, but understanding those wonderful principles that say, if I think you're not the right one, where is that in me? You are a reflection of me. So even when I look at my sons, I go, okay, uh, when we had all of the murders that were kind of um, concentrated between what, 2011, 2014, all the school threats, my sons had all of that sitting in them. Scared to go to school because they weren't sure if it was going to be their school, only to have one year show up where their middle school was targeted. And I said, well, how did this come home? I said, help me understand this. Here's how I understood it. In 76 to 77, or 77 primarily, remember the Atlanta killings? Mm -hmm. I remember internalizing that and wondering how safe it would or would not be for a young black male to move through society when they, somebody has decided we're not valuable. So I watched it play out in its own way in my son's thinking, which led to conversations around suicidal thoughts. And I'll never forget because their mom and I were divorced. They were at their mom's, called me, said, dad, I'm having thoughts of hurting myself. And I said, I let me go fast. Are we talking suicidal thoughts? Said, yes, jumped in the car, we met as a family in the minivan, in mm. that conversation, I said, look, I'm your father and there's only so far I can go with what I impart to you. But you know, I've taken therapy. I've run to therapy because I knew that was just somebody God would bless me with that could see what I could not see and help me understand it in a way that I could embody it. They both jumped into therapy, which shifted all their dynamics and allowed them to get grounded in the self that is the aspect of God that we're created to be that they continue to nurture. So even with Aiden's message to me, whether he knows it or not, that's a nurturance of the self because he can't give what he doesn't possess. So mm -hmm. that for me is just a powerful iteration and reflection that, okay, Robert, as you continue to heal, because what I've recognized is not only does healing happen, we like to use the analogy of an onion. What I'm clear about is my healing has turned my floor into a ceiling, right? So where I was at one moment, now I'm on top of that. But I've recognized that being in this new space means, as you said, Courtney, there's time to do work because there is a new evolution. And I have no problem saying there is a period in the last nine months where I could say my behaviors in certain areas were woefully inept. 
<laughs> and I, I likened it to spiritual atrophy. Uh -huh. That's the only way I understand it, where I curled up, where I was rearranging the proverbial deck chairs on the Titanic, but that thing's still going down. And I could have easily made it about any and everybody other than myself. But again, spiritual law, as within, so without, lets me know if I'm seeing it out there. It must be reflected here. It was an invitation to get clear and to heal. Y'all talked about it, and I'm a hush. Y'all talked about seeing where you hurt. Yeah, I loved when you brought that. And sometimes the easiest way to see that is to see it in others. Mm. Let me see what's showing up in others. If you don't see it there, check the material stuff. Are the lights going off on my car? Because the battery is an indication of my battery draining here. Windshield wiper fluid says my vision may not be clear. Like there are a bunch of different ways to connect to how we hurt. But one of the pieces I would offer Iyanla is it's great to connect to the hurt. And it is great and it has been profound as a black male to understand how powerful it is to heal. But what happens when I connect to the hurt and I recognize it takes me into a new space and I don't know what to do? Hold it right there, God, because we're going to lose Courtney. Courtney, final word on the invisible ache. What do you want us to know? Just pray. Uh -huh. Just pray and uh, do what, take the, the, the difficult step. Sometimes the most difficult step is to just say, I need help. Mm -hmm. And after you do that, I think you, you may find that uh, there's, there's more people there than you think there are. I love you, Courtney B. Vance. Please kiss Miss Angela for me, although I know you don't need an excuse to kiss her. Let her know that this is from me. Dr. Robin, the invisible ache, what do you want to yes, say? Yes, I will just say um, this and love you, Courtney. I know you've got to go. That Coach Robert, you just said um, something that is so important about looking at parts of yourself that you had not seen. And what I would just invite people to do right now is that we if we are brutal at what we see in ourselves we will run from the image mm. and so compassion and tenderness to the self is part of there those are part tools we need so we can look in the mirror and see what is looking back but with kindness and tenderness and compassion and lastly, let us remember whether it is someone who is having suicidal thoughts, Coach Robert, you just shared that, or, or it is someone listening tonight, first of all, you can reach out to the, the prevention lifeline um, number and text or call at 988. But let's not shut down people who are hurting, because sometimes we, Iyanla, will say, oh, don't say that. I mean, you have so much to live for. Don't say that. You know, what would I do without you? Don't say that. And so I just want to remind us that when someone brings their heart to us, that what we want to do is open the floor for them to bring their feelings. And this is the tool. Instead of saying, don't say that, say, tell me more. Ah. It's the exact opposite. Instead of don't tell me, I can't bear, I couldn't live without you. This isn't about you, mom or dad. It's about the person who is hurting with that invisible ache. When they bring the ache and it feels too much to bear, ask them to tell you more. Mm. Is there more? Is there something more to the the ache and the thoughts of that life is not w worth living. Tell me more. That is the most courageous intervention that we could give when pain abides, that we would ask that person to tell us more. Deep bow, Dr. Robin. Thank you so, so much. I want to get in touch with you. So yes. that when you start the Invisible Egg Book Club, you come in one of the evenings and be Absolutely. with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We will do that. And I want to do that because we need to catch up anyhow. So, okay. um, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that we um, are doing. And thank you, Dr. Perry. Thank you, Coach Robert. And Yanla, I honor you. Thank you, thank you so much. God bless. Okay.
Dr. Steve, the invisible ache. What's your final word? Well, I think what makes it invisible is our decision to keep it away from people. Mm. To open ourselves up is to open ourselves up to public consumption. And as such, for judgment. And the last thing that someone needs when you're feeling low is for people to put upon them what they think and feel even lower. So we hold it in, we keep it to ourselves. Yeah. Coach Robert, the invisible, and Coach St Dr. Steve, you're going to come do uh, an evening in the book club with me, right? I will have read the book. <laughs> you're going to come do an evening with me, right? Hey, I cannot wait. <laughs> Coach Robert, yes. the invisible ape, what do you want to leave us with? It's along the lines of what Dr. Perry just said. Mm -hmm. It's what someone shared with me. Be gentle. Um, and I understand it now as I can choose to be content in the midst of the healing, uh, in the midst of the ache. I can choose to give thanks in the midst of the ache. I can choose to have faith. And I'm discovering that just those three be, do, haves, if you will, are supporting and nurturing new awarenesses, um, expedited healing, and just a new internal connection. And I think when we have an ache, if you think about how you handle a headache, notice how we tend to move slowly and we're a little more cautious and we tend to say less and we tend to do less. And I think that is the equivalent of that passage in the opening of the book that says, can you be still to allow the mud to settle? Yeah, and in yeah. the Bible, it says, be still and know that I am God. So mm. I think just the combination of that is the act of gentleness as we kind of play with what is healing, what is manhood. Uh, and God forbid you actually look up what H-U means in front of the man. That's a profound connection because there's a connection to the Egyptian notion and the connection to a song for God is a mantra. So maybe it's be human more than it is being just a black man may have a connection to the divinity that's already there that has been cut or put aside. You know, I love you, Coach Robert. You're going to come do an evening with me in the book club, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I want to thank everybody that has joined it. I want to say to my sister women, thank you. Thank you for being still and allowing the men to step forward. We weren't able to get to all of your comments, but I do appreciate you to the men who are here, to the ones who are listening, the ones you know. The Invisible Ache Book Club begins on Thursday, April 18th via Zoom. Thursday, April 18th via Zoom from 7.30 to 9 p.m. We're going to walk through this book two chapters at a time. Courtney will be there with us. Dr. Robin will be there with us. Uh, Coach Robert will be there with us. Dr. Steve will be there with us um, so that we can unpack it. You can unpack it and make it personal to you. You can ask questions. You can share experiences so that we can begin to take action, not just reading. So again, the book club itself is April 18th from 7.30 to 9 via Zoom. So you can put your camera on. You don't have to put your camera on. Women will not be allowed. Women will not be uh, allowed in the men's space. I'm there as a facilitator. Dr. Robin will be there as a facilitator. Women, give the men the space. Let them be. That was what Courtney said. Let them be. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to do that. Moving into... Um, up from here, which will be the healing portion. Once we get through the book and get able to look at the ache and identify what the ache is, we're going to do a nine week healing process called Up From Here. It'll be nine weeks online, four days in person, and we're, we're taking it slow. We're walking slow. Um, in the nine weeks online, men will be able to work together in their clans, meaning their age groups. I don't want to call it a rites of passage. Um, I really, I don't know what to call it, but it's a healing. <laughs> so if you want to start, go read up from here. Right now we're doing the invisible ache. There is a financial commitment 
for the Invisible Eight. That five weeks with myself, Coach Robert, Dr. Steve, Courtney, Dr. Robin, $53. Because when I was praying about doing the book club, the Holy Spirit made it very clear to me, every adult man needs to be able to invest in his own evolution. Give it away for free and it won't be valued. Every man needs to be able and willing to invest in his own revolution. So this is how they broke it down to me. $10 a week a man is spending on himself, particularly if he's never been to therapy. And the $3 is for me so I can go buy quilting fabric. <laughs> so if you want to know out there, you men, what I want you to do for me, pay your $53 so I can get my $3 so I can go buy me some quilted fabric because when I get done with y'all, I'm going to need to make a quilt. The Invisible Ache, Thursday, uh, April 18, 7.30 to 9.30, I mean 7.30 to 9 Eastern Standard Time. We're going to do two chapters a week. You can start your reading. Um, the book is not included in the cost of the workshop. That's an investment. That is an investment in your healing. There's the schedule. Week one, we're doing chapter one and two. Week two, chapter three and four, and so on. I want to thank Courtney B. Vance. He's in the middle of production. He took time. Dr. Robin got rid of all of her clients so that she could be there. Dr. Steve dropped what he was doing to be here. Coach Robert spent his whole evening here. And I want to thank you, brothers, you brother men out there for showing up. I hope this has stirred up the mud in you. I hope it has stirred up the mud in you and that you come to the book club to learn how to sit until the dirt settles. I want to thank the women for showing up. Let us learn how to be. And we're not going to compete with them. We are not. Well, I need this. I need. No, 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 no. 42 years I've been working with y'all. I'm turning my attention to men. Plus, I'm single now. I need some eye candy. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for showing up. It's been my honor to serve you, to love you. Deep bow. See you next time.